To get us off and running this morning is a gentleman that uh, probably few of you know in person, but you know his name, John Peterman, the serial entrepreneur, if you will, of the J. Peterman Company, a man who is not afraid to come up with new ideas, start new businesses, take on new challenges. And he will tell you that he has a strong balance of both failed ventures to go along with his many successful ventures. This is true of most entrepreneurs. He told me this morning, once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur. He has a new venture, even as we speak, coming out. And I'm very interested in hearing about it. It's called Plant MD. When John left this market and went on to greater things, um, I was a little sad, but I did find that I had more disposable income <laughs> because his catalog is so fascinating, and some of you will remember it. He was one of the first catalog uh, merchandise providers that actually went out into the world, exotic locations, brought merchandise back for sale, and built exotic stories around the merchandise. So Cindy and I always looked forward to his catalog coming every month. It's a great pleasure to introduce John Peterman, and I look forward to his remarks today. So let's welcome John to Lexington. Thank you. I wanted to make sure that uh, you knew that I still wear the duster. <laughs> So how did you become a figment or a character on Seinfeld? <laughs> now, there's probably some people in here who don't even know Seinfeld. Seinfeld in the 90s was the number one television show. And 50 million people watched it every time it was on. And uh, we had, uh, we were, chugging along in the J. Peterman Company in the 90s and building things, and I was, uh, I was on a uh, red eye coming back from San Francisco, and I got into Lexington, walked into the office, and I said, you were on Seinfeld last night. And I said, look, I'm a little tired. I've been on the airplane. I wasn't on Seinfeld. And I said, no, no, you were on Seinfeld. So somebody had taped the Seinfeld show that night. And that was the first I knew about it. So we went in and we sat down and there was this tall, really good looking guy who's now a personal friend of mine, but at the time I had no idea who he was. And uh, so there was the internal conversations going on in the company. Oh my God, John, the guy's a buffoon. He's over the top. He's not at all like you are. And I said, that's a very good thing where he wouldn't be on television. And so we uh, went back and forth. And uh, if you are a Seinfeld fan, you'll remember that the Soup Nazi was on at the same time. The Soup Nazi was a Jewish guy in New York who didn't like being called a Nazi. And he made soup. And so he sued them. And they took him off the air. But he debuted the same time that Jay Peterman did. And so the uh, attorneys went to Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, and they said, you know, we think you ought to go talk to Peterman before we go forward with this. So they called me up, and they said, we're going to do this character. And I said, let's see. 50 million people see the name every week. <laughs> The guy is kind of making fun of the brand. Well, you will learn as an entrepreneur that any publicity is good. So he said, fine. So they'd send me the, uh, uh, the scripts. And, and of course, doing a little writing myself, I didn't want anybody tampering with anything I wrote, particularly somebody I didn't know. And so I never changed a word on them. I later found out from O'Hurley that uh, uh, 
they never followed the scripts anyway. Everything was ad-libbed on the show. But it did serve me well one time because uh, I got the script and I found out that uh, Peterman's mother died in that show. So I called up my sister and I said, uh, before the show, and I said, uh, mother was old at that time living with my sister. And uh, I said, uh, does mother watch Seinfeld? She says, oh yeah, every time you're on it. Yeah, she watches it. So I said, well, sit close to her tonight because she dies on the show. <laughs> So the real thing is, how do you get all of a sudden to be an icon in the 90s or at any time? Well, it's a couple of things, and they all have to do with entrepreneurship, and obviously, and they all have to do with any kind of business. And it starts out with, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to be a dreamer. If you're not a dreamer, if you have no dreams, you know, you'll, you'll just go along with the flow of the things and you won't create anything different. So being a dreamer, was I ever a dreamer? I'm a, I, I am the number one dreamer. Unreasonable dreams. And I have adopted the attitude that no matter how old you are, once you stop dreaming, um, it's pretty close to the end. So I continue to dream. More and more as the older I get. But when I was a freshman in high school, I was five foot eleven. Uh, no, four foot eleven, I'm sorry. Four foot eleven and ninety-five pounds. Uh, they wouldn't let me play in the football games because I was afraid I'd get squashed. But I had a dream to be a professional baseball player. And the guys I were dreaming about were a lot bigger than I was. I wasn't very strong uh, at 4 foot 11, 95 pounds. All the girls I wanted to go out with were six inches, a foot taller than I was. Uh, but eventually I grew. Uh, eventually, uh, I went to college, and, uh, and when I graduated from college, I signed uh, with the Pittsburgh Pirates. So if you dream, you'd be surprised that your dreams can come true. Now, I didn't make the majors. Uh, part of playing baseball is staying put together, and I had a problem with that. So then I had to drop back to other dreams that I had. Um, maybe it was my dream to be Marco Polo. Or at the time, maybe it was a dream to get a job and support my family. So I got a job, support my family, but I never lost my dreams. And I had a dream to have a horse. I, I grew up around horses, but never had one of myself. I didn't get my first horse until I was 40. But I went through the corporate things, uh, General Foods Corporation, Castle and Cook Foods Corporation, um, began to get exposed to lots of things, uh, always with these ideas of dreaming and doing my own thing for some reason. I know when I worked for General Foods, I had a territory that included uh, about four or five SEC schools. And so I'm going there anyway, so I decided to start an advertising business. And uh, I'd recruit students on campus, and uh, uh, then I'd have them go around and collect all the uh, information that any incoming freshman would want. And then we'd put it into a booklet, and we would uh, go around and uh, sell advertising to it print up the booklet and distribute it free to all the students when they, uh, all the freshmen when they got on campus through the bookstores. And just about the time that we did the first one that worked, I got promoted to Chicago. So uh, I left that business. Uh, but always in the back of my mind, looking for an entrepreneur, looking for a, a thing that I should do. So I went through various jobs, wound up with uh, International Spike here in, in Lexington, and uh, loved Lexington and got fired after three years. Uh, that was not a successful venture. 
uh, <clears throat> well, I've, I've been fired a couple of times. Uh, uh, one, one of the reasons that I get fired is that um, I, I tend to think for myself and don't stick to the program because I think the program is wrong. So that doesn't work well in the corporate atmosphere. <clears throat> so I got fired and I uh, began doing, I didn't want to move from Lexington, so I do what you do when you don't have a job. I became a consultant. And uh, I started uh, being a marketing consultant and, uh, uh, and I knew something about the food business, so I bought uh, uh, partnered with Steve Hall, who owned Halls on the River, and we started Halls Beer Cheese. Uh, not started it, he had it down there, but we started distributing it throughout the Southeast. Um, that was a successful venture because, uh, well, sort of. Um, Steve uh, was in Vietnam and, uh, and got cancer and died, so uh, we sold the company. And, uh, but we sold it for a quarter of a million dollars at the time, and that was a, that was a good deal. And uh, his wife got half, and I got half. So then I'm still consulting, and I am out in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And uh, I wasn't supposed to be in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I was supposed to be someplace else. But I'm a very impulsive person. So I'm walking in Jackson Hole. I'd never been to a fancy resort place like that. There's a little Western store there. So I walked in and I bought a duster. And I bought it because it was long. I bought it because I wanted it to be different. I bought it because I'm a romantic. And it had snaps on it where you could snap it up so it wouldn't be full length like that duster was. I walked out of the store and I had it snapped up, you know, like a trench coat. And I said, why did you buy this coat? You bought this coat because it was long and it made a statement and it said who you were that you didn't care what other people think, which is a good attribute for an entrepreneur. Uh, so I unsnapped it and I put it all the way down and uh, I went up to see my friend in uh, New York who was in the advertising business and I walked into his apartment and I had on my duster and my cowboy hat and uh, I've been a wannabe cowboy since I was 12 uh, and uh, I kind of have a few credentials as a cowboy but not a real cowboy. Uh, so I walked into his apartment and he said, you know what, Peterman, I like you better because you're wearing that. I said, you know what, I noticed in the airport a lot of people like me better because I'm wearing this. <laughs> and he said, I said, you know, let's write, he was a great uh, genius at, at writing and he did all the writing in the catalog in the beginning. And, uh, I said, let's, let's run an ad and see if we can sell some of these, make a few hundred dollars. So we ran this little ad about uh, the wilds of Wall Street and uh, uh, makes you look good, and covers your rump and, and all the rest. And uh, we ran it in the Lexington Herald Leader. Zippo. <laughs> Nada. My accountant's secretary at the time happened to see it, so she wanted one, but I had it discounted, so we don't count that as a sale. <laughs> so then we uh, ran an ad in uh, someplace else, and ran an ad someplace else, and we'd sell a few here and a few there. This was all the duster at $174. And by the way, folks, Selling anything through space ads is the most difficult way in the world to build a business. So if you succeed through space ads, you know you're hitting a, a, some sort of a mark. So we uh, ran that, ran that. Finally, we ran an ad in the New Yorker. Now the New Yorker was, uh, uh, I think, Oh, I don't, I forget how much it was, but let's say it was $10,000. Uh, 
So the way we built the business initially was <clears throat> I would buy the dusters on 30-day terms. Then we would run the ads to sell the duster. The New Yorker ads are due on the 10th of the month following the month that they ran in. So we'd sell enough um, dusters to pay for the ads, but then we wouldn't have enough money to pay for the dusters, so we had to order more dusters and sell more, run more ads, and, and it was literally this snowball effect, and we were going from hand to mouth. Nobody was making any money in, in the thing. We were just building the business that began to catch on, that began to catch on. And, uh, and then we'd, uh, we were watching um, uh, other people where they were running ads, and, and uh, so we'd run ads there in the Atlantic and uh, mostly literary uh, uh, publications. Then we'd go into the Wall Street Journal and uh, the New York Times Sunday ad section. And we now had expanded our product line from the duster to this shirt, the J. Peterman shirt, 99% Jefferson, 1% Peterman. And, uh, and then we had a mailbag. I found a retired mailman, and he had an old leather bag, and we kind of liked it, so we reduced the size a little bit, and that became the mailbag. By the way, these items are all still selling, all top sellers in the business today. And we, uh, uh, we sold those, and I borrowed 20000 from the bank, and, uh, uh, and uh, that's what we survived on up to a point. And, and my good old banker came to me, and he says, John, he says, I, I want you to understand something. He said, we're a bank, and we lend money. I said, right. He says, so we lend money, we charge interest, that's how, how we make money, and then you pay the money back. Uh, well, okay. Well, I can't pay the money back yet, but I'm paying you interest. He says, that's the thing, I think you need capital. So, uh, capital. I had no idea what capital was. No, literally. And had no idea what a venture capitalist was. Literally. And so I got a book, Venture Capitalists and Lists, and the internet wasn't around at that time. And I started plowing through Venture Capitalists. So we made up this business plan. I still have it. Very rudimentary. However, I uh, started contacting Venture Capitalists. Sent out a hundred. I would talk to them send them the business plan. A hundred business plans. Nobody. They would say, oh, yeah, this is very interesting. Um, so you've been in the apparel business? No, never been in the apparel business. Oh, okay. Well, you've been in the catalog business. Tell us about your experience in the catalog business. Never been in the catalog business. Maybe you ought to go look for money someplace else. So went on and, and it was, you know, the business was growing and when you have a business like this based on an idea, on a romantic conception, uh, that uh, it chews up money. And so you're constantly Peter and Paul and we're keeping the business going. We finally decided that maybe we ought to have a catalog. So we had a catalog with six items in it. A little old lady pasted swatches in the back, but she died. Then we had to get it printed in color. Um, and you're going through all this, and you're running out of money. And I, didn't, I said to myself, well, I don't have anything, so I have nothing to lose. Uh, and I have a high tolerance for risk. And I've been told I'm a little stupid sometimes, mainly by my wife. but. Uh, so we're going along and we're right to the edge. The printer says, I ain't printing your catalog. Uh, and then we're up to 14 pages or something now. And um, he said, I'm not printing it because um, you stole me money. And I get this telephone call. 
and it says, uh, this is Alex Hambro. Uh, I'm with Hambro America, and we've seen your ads in the New Yorker and the New York Times, and we thought that you might be interested in some capital. Are you interested in looking for any capital? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so Alex Hambro, Hambro America was the venture capital arm of the Hambro Bank of England, and Alex was one of the sons tutoring with a fellow named Ed Goodman. Uh, Ed Goodman is, uh, owns, uh, was running Hambro America now, now runs his own venture capital firm, and it's the Goodman as in Bergdorf Goodman. Uh, in which he still owns that little piece of real estate up there in New York City on Fifth Avenue. Uh, so Ed came down, or Alex came down first, looked it over, and then Ed came down. And there was nothing. We were on Midland Avenue upstairs. Uh, I was making cheese downstairs, running the consulting business over here, and I had dusters in a room over here in a loft and a pop belly stove for heat. It was ideal. I mean, that's the stuff movies are made out of. And, uh, uh, and running out of no money, uh, constantly running out of money. And uh, so Ed came down and uh, looked around and uh, said, uh, what do you think the businesses were? Uh, we went to lunch at uh, Ramsey's, when it used to be up there. He says, uh, what do you think the business is worth? I said, I, I don't know, well, two or three million? So uh, he says, all right, two million. First lesson, never say two or three million. If you mean three, say three, or if you mean four, say four. Never give him a low shot. So, and he would have invested probably at three if I said three. Or maybe he would have said, nah, let's, let's do two. So he put in a million dollars at two million dollar uh, or three million dollar uh, post money valuation. And we were off and running. And that was all history. Uh, we raised uh, 38 million uh, total capital going out. Um, I traveled the world uh, to fulfill the concept. Uh, I have lunched with maharajas and princesses and no queens, no kings. Uh, I've been hosted at embassy parties and this is what happens when you build a brand that becomes an icon that hits a chord. But the lessons are in the beginning and at the end, the lessons being that you don't go anywhere without a dream. Two, you're going to need money, no matter what you think. And the idea of entrepreneurship, in my mind, is you can't give back anything you can't employ people unless you make money. And if you make money, you can build a big organization. And you can employ a lot of people if that's the deal. But if you don't make any money, you will disappear. At one time, we employed 600 uh, people. Um, we expanded a little too quickly in uh, uh, on the retail scene and went bankrupt in 1999. Second lesson, or third lesson, or fourth lesson, or whatever it is, is don't believe your own press. Um, you've got to make money to stay in business. Uh, be careful of all the smart people you hire. And uh, a little bit of um, Common sense and how fast you expand is, is always important. So was Jay Peterman successful? Yes, up, uh, very successful, but then it became a failed venture because it went bankrupt. A word about press for entrepreneurs. Now on the way up, Jay Peterman was golden. 
He was the most wonderful person in the world. He was traveled all over the world, was intriguing till they met me. Uh, and then uh, and then when I went bankrupt, all the bad stuff. Peterman was a terrible businessman, uh, all of the bad things. Probably the good press affected me a little bit and I never got cocky, I never got, uh, I believe that everything goes around in a circle, so you should never get too cocky, never get too depressed because it all goes around. Um, but I knew that we were doing well and I enjoyed the positive publicity. Uh, I did not enjoy going bankrupt on national television. So, but that goes with the territory. Uh, and I never said anything about all the uh, bad publicity. There was nothing to say. Uh, probably, uh, most of it was probably true. Uh, but I just said, okay, you guys wait. I'll come back. Two years later, uh, the company that bought us a bankruptcy got into trouble. Uh, I got a couple of partners and we bought the business back and then restarted it and it's still going today. So a lot of ups and downs in entrepreneurship. It's a hell of a lot of fun. I am unemployable. No one would hire me and I would not want, and I've been unemployable for years because I just simply don't want to work for somebody else. I will work with anybody, but I don't want to work for anybody else, and that's one of the things about entrepreneurs. They make lousy employees. Just ask my son, who's running the J. Peterman Company. He thinks I'm the worst employee going because I'm not an employee. So, <clears throat> as was mentioned, um, you never get it out of your bones. I thought that I was kind of pulling back from J. Peterman uh, about a year ago, so I decided to start another business. Uh, and uh, I'm not 25 anymore, but I'll match energy with you. Uh, so I started this business that I had done once before. I, in fact, I did it just prior to starting the J. Peterman Company. Is we diagnose houseplant ailments at the time in 1980s by mail. So you took a leaf and you put it in an envelope and mailed it to us and we diagnosed it. And we ran a full page ad in the New York Times and it said, send us your weak, your weary, your mysteriously blotched yellowing leaves and we will tell you what's wrong with them, okay? <clears throat> we got about 700, 800 responses. We had bought the full page ad in the Times for 10,000 and we got about 7,000 back in. And my partner and I looked at each other and we said, should we get a bigger truck or should we start another business? So we started another business. However, in addition to getting $7,000 in, which had we had capital or if I knew what capital was at that time, probably would have been a good business to pursue. Uh, but I did wind up on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I got, uh, almost got Dr. Anderson at UK fired for helping us because they said he was uh, the head of uh, something in the Wall Street Journal and the UK dean got very upset. That, but we never paid him. He didn't ask to be paid or anything. So he was clean as a whistle and kept his job. And. Uh, then I, from the uh, front page of the Wall Street Journal, then I wound up on Good Morning America, the Today Show, 15 news shows. I was just being flown up to New York for one television show after the other. And uh, uh, they, uh, uh, I was sitting in the, in the green room, or the yellow room, or whatever they call it, the warm-up bullpen for the Today Show. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, and there's this guy sitting across from me, and I said, boy, he looks familiar. And he has this entourage of three or four people around him. So I'm dressing in a suit. That's the last time I ever dressed in a suit. 
And uh, I'm sitting there, and uh, look, and he looks at me so funny, and so he says, he says, hi, he says, my name's Tommy Lee Jones, I do movies. Son of a gun, that's who that is. I said, hi, I'm, I'm John Peterman, I'm a houseplant doctor. <laughs> and he looked at me, that was it, we never talked again. So, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of fun stories on it, but it was a viable business, and now that's what I'm doing again. The internet has changed everything. Um, we have built the whole processing thing uh, on algorithms uh, so that we could, uh, when you fill out the questionnaire, we can instantaneously tell you what it is. We still have horticulturalists look at it because 70% of people who have houseplants don't know what they are. They just buy them because they look good someplace, and then they wonder why they don't grow. Uh, the business is about $3.4 billion a year, and there's no competition. There are a few academics who say that they uh, want to, uh, uh, or will diagnose your house plan, but sometimes it takes them three or four weeks because they're doing it. We charge $6.85, and uh, there are 70, no, 700 million people Googling specific plants uh, on, uh, uh, on an annual basis uh, for help. So we have an SEO and SEM expert uh, on it, and if we can capture that, and then because I own the J. Peterman Company, um, uh, about eight million people will see a page in the catalog about send us your week, you're weary. So this is launching as we speak. I have no idea whether it's going to work. I think it's going to work or I wouldn't have done it. I think that um, all, the, all the metrics are right, but then you never know. So it's a big risk. I threw a big chunk of my own money into it, and then I raised other capital. I now know what capital is, and uh, so we're off to find out. So if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, it never ends until you get there. If you have any, that's kind of my story. That's my stick. I hope you can get something out of that in your own entrepreneurial life. If you got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes? So, in all your business failures, I know you mentioned you had your wife and money was tight and stuff. What was your wife doing to you or about you? What was her conversation? <laughs> well, you really don't want to know that. Um, no, she's uh, very supportive. Uh, uh, she, when we had the cheese business, she worked in that business. Um, when uh, we went to Jay Peterman, she worked in that business, became head of customer service. When I started up the new company, I brought her back. In the meantime, she went and got a job with when the Lexington Legends were uh, uh, just starting here. Um, Alan Stein, uh, she went down and got a job with Alan Stein, getting it started, wound up the number one salesperson. Uh, so, and she said that's the best job she's ever had. Um, it's very difficult uh, on the wife to have to work with the husband all the time. Because, uh, and particularly if the husband's an entrepreneur, because entrepreneurs are um, not easy to work with sometimes um, until you get an organization. One of the things that in, in entrepreneurship that you should be aware of, I have never hired a person who I didn't think was smarter than I was. I have never hired anybody who I thought would just be a, okay, I'm just gonna tell them what to do. Even if they were in the warehouse or wherever they were, I wanted them to be smarter than I was about what they did. And I was pretty successful with that, and Jay Peterman, and actually all of, uh, all of the businesses that I've started. Uh, this houseplant thing, I have um, four main people involved, and they all have skill sets and that are way above my head. I, I wouldn't know how to do any one of their skill sets. 
And that's what you should do as an entrepreneur. Never hire anybody who isn't smarter than you. Anything else anyone would like to know? Yep. You said earlier that you thought that uh, J.P. Ruben had grown too much too quickly and that that was part of the problem. How do you know how much, how much you should be growing? It's easier said than done. Yeah, well, that's kind of an excuse. Um, <laughs> I did not manage the growth properly, okay? Uh, we were growing, here was, here was Jay Peterman. Uh, went from zero to 300,000 the first year, and I think we lost 300,000. And went from 300,000 to 1.2 million. Went from 1.2 million to 5 million. Went from 5 million to 20 million went from 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 75 and out. Uh, the problem uh, with that kind of a business uh, is that it's um, uh, inventory is what gets you. And uh, if, you're, if you don't manage your inventory very, very well, then um, it chews up cash. So if you have $25 million of inventory in your warehouse, that's $25 million in cash. And if you only need $15 million of inventory to run the business, so you have $10 million of cash sitting in, that's a lot of money. And uh, so, and then, uh, so it really, if I had managed the growth better, if I knew, uh, and supposedly I had hired, uh, you know, I had a lot of sophisticated venture capitalists in there, and, um, uh, they uh, deny it to the day, but there's this unsaid pressure to grow, 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 and uh, we'll give you cash, 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 and of course you get diluted, 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 uh, and, uh, but it was, looking back, I, in all reality, it was my fault for not managing the growth. So you just learn from that. Answer? Okay. Anything? Yes. Oh. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>